We all struggle with feeling like there's not enough time in the day to be productive personally or professionally. We all struggle to make our time matter. It's time to take control. It's time to start investing in the corporation of you. At Athena, they've helped over 700 ambitious professionals achieve more by connecting them with best in class globally remote executive assistants. Athena executive assistants go beyond basic administration tasks. They help you make time matter through the art of delegation. They believe delegation is the superpower of all highly successful people. And your personal EA will help you get there. Your EA is a one on one long term partner to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. Take back your time. Join the waitlist at athenago.com. That's athenago.com. Hi, I'm Brianna Seely, producer for Offscript Health. Welcome to the heart of healthcare. Before we get started today, I'd like to tell our listeners about another show in the Offscript Health Podcast Network Beyond the Paper Gown. Beyond the Paper Gown is candid, credible, and curated. Listen in to learn how host Dr. Mitzi Crockover can inspire, empower, and inform women with the latest information about their health and healthcare choices. Check out the latest episode, an innovator spotlight on Rosie, the sexual health app, featuring Dr. Lindsay Harper, OBGYN, founder and CEO of Rosie, an award-winning women's health technology company. Or the Sexual Health Matters episode where Dr. Mitzi Crockover and Dr. Lindsay Harper talk about common complaints and treatment options for those with sexual health concerns. For more information, visit offscript.com slash shows. The link will be in our show notes. Enjoy the show. Hi, podcast listeners. I'm your host, Hallie Teco. Welcome back to our show. I have a favor to ask of you. If you like this show, it would be a huge help if you could rate and review The Heart of Healthcare wherever you listen to podcasts. The best way to reduce your carbon footprint, limit global warming, halt the collapse of biodiversity, save wildlife, and ensure enough clean water for all of us is to ditch meat from animals. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Patrick Brown, the founder and chief visionary of Impossible Foods, a company at the forefront of making healthier, plant-based meat and dairy products with the mission of ending animal farming and improving the health of customers and Mother Earth. The idea for Impossible Foods came to Pat while he was on sabbatical from his position as professor of biochemistry at Stanford University School of Medicine. In reflecting on how he could use his training and expertise to make the largest positive impact on the world, he realized there was a way to make delicious, affordable meat and dairy products directly from plants that would be better for the environment and for customers. In 2011, Pat chose to devote himself full-time to Impossible Foods, and the rest is history. Patrick, thanks for being here today. Oh, pleasure. You started Impossible Foods at age 60, and you could have coasted to retirement as a professor at Stanford, but instead you started a company. Tell me about this itch that you just needed to scratch. Well, first of all, the last thing I would have wanted to do is coast to retirement. So, But really, I wasn't looking to do anything else. I, I, I loved my job at Stanford. It basically... My job description was just to um, follow my curiosity and discover and invent things. And it was a dream job. But I, in the course of a sabbatical, I started trying to identify what problem in the world, uh, what was the most important problem in the world that I could contribute to solving. And, and in the course of that, I realized that there's a very strong answer to that, which is the catastrophic impact of uh, the use of animals as a food technology, which is by far the most destructive technology on earth. And we can talk about that if you want. But And I realize that we're not going to be able to get rid of it by telling people what to eat or telling farmers what to grow. And it's absolutely essential for the future of the world that that we eliminate it as completely as possible. 
but that there was a way to do it, which is just to realize that it's a technology and it's a terrible technology. It's a technology that we've used since prehistoric times to effectively turn plant biomass into these very desirable foods, meat, fish, and dairy foods. It's incredibly inefficient resource-wise and also economically. And at that point, and at this point, it seemed to me that it was entirely within our capabilities based on what we know about you know, how to understand things at the, at the molecular level that we could figure out how to make products that are not only vastly more sustainable and healthier and more affordable, but even more delicious than the than the ones that we make using the old animal-based technology. Mm. And so nobody was doing that. And so I just felt like, okay, well, first of all, this is the most important problem, the most urgent problem in the world. And I can't not work on it. So I, um, yeah, so I quit my job no and choice. I realized, yeah, and it had to be, um, to, in order to be able to scale, you couldn't do this as a kind of uh, academic or a nonprofit thing because mm. it's not just solving an interesting scientific problem. It's a strategic problem. How do, you, mm. how do you actually effectively compete in the marketplace with better products that better serve consumers? And the goal really, we said at the outset, was to completely replace as completely as possible, but ideally completely replace the use of animals in the food system by 2035. So I just felt like I got to be all in on this. Mm -hmm. And that's why that it was a no brainer. It was not, there was no angst at all. I mean, that's what I had to do. Yeah. And you were quite early on raising this red flag of the meat industry being so destructive to the planet. How has kind of the understanding of this impact evolved since you started raising that flag? It's evolved a bit. I, I mean, when I went to the Paris Climate Conference, which was probably five or six years ago, I was literally the only person talking about this as a climate issue. I wasn't the only person who was aware of it, because when I would talk to the other attendees who were, you know, in the kind of clim climate environment world, oh, they were aware of it. But they just, uh, it, it was something that was completely off the radar in a way for them because they sort of had this uh, delusion that, you know, the use of animals, uh, farming animals and the use of animals in the food system was like a hardwired aspect of the world. And it, it was not something they thought of as a, a, a knob they could turn, basically. So no one was talking about it. Literally, I was the only person at the entire conference who said a word about it. And in fact, I couldn't find... Uh, I couldn't have a plant-based meal at the entire event. Every snack, every meal that they served had meat and fish and dairy food in it. So that, you know, the, there was some awareness, but just massive indifference, basically. Now, you know, I was at the COP in, in Scotland, and they made a deliberate effort to have plant-based options at every meal. So kudos to them for that. Okay, yeah. Um, the fact that they weren't that there were other options that were insanely destructive, you know, was a problem, but we'll take whatever progress we can get. And it certainly is still is not a very prominent part of the discussion, not nearly as prominent as it should be. From a climate standpoint, basically, there is a way to do something that nobody even talks about in the climate world, which is that we could put the brakes on climate change within a, a, a decade and a half and create a 30-year pause in global heating, basically, in, in uh, 30 years of net zero greenhouse gas emissions, just by phasing out animal agriculture and just doing that one thing. And we need to do it by 2050 because the, you know, I think people are not aware that the impacts of, cli of global temperature, global heating, are nonlinear. And things are going to get a lot worse in the next couple of decades. In fact, an interesting aspect of this is the economic impact. There was a study published recently, by, or a year ago, by um, the biggest reinsurance company in the world, Swiss Re. They're the company that insures insurers. They insure, insure other insurance companies against catastrophic disasters that would bankrupt them. So they, the, the, this is a, you know, a core interest of theirs is to accurately predict the economic impact of climate change. And they published this study that basically said that in the year 2050, the impact on global GDP 
just of climate change will be about a 10% reduction in global GDP. And in some parts of the world, like Southeast Asia and Africa, it'll be a 30% reduction. So effectively, what they're saying is, and this, this is by 2050, and it's not going to just suddenly hit in 2050, it's going to be happening between now and then, and it's going to keep happening, getting worse, that we're staring on the barrel of the biggest global economic depression in modern history, just from climate change. And, and this is a report from a group that has... Their entire business depends on being able to print this. But there have been other, other studies also that didn't get much attention, including from the U.S. government, that have basically said the same thing, that, that in a very short period of time, the economic impact is going to be an unprecedented hit on the global economy and the U.S. economy. And then there's the fact that the World Economic Forum said that by 2050, there will be potentially a billion people displaced by the impact of climate change. So none of this gets much attention, but the point is it's no. urgent. And we can do it by 2050 just by phasing out animal agriculture. I, I published yeah. a paper on this earlier earlier this year. So why doesn't it get more attention, though? Why why do we talk so much about electric cars as, a, as the solution? I am not a sociologist, but I'll, <laughs> I, I think that it, the climate impact and the environmental impact of cars takes place right before your eyes, okay? Mm. The climate impact of your food choices takes place out of sight and and deliberately so. Mm. I mean, the 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 slaughter industry really wants to keep everything about their business as far away from the eyes of consumers as possible because it's a complete horror show. So, you know, it's 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 a harder job of connecting the dots basically. And then there's, you know, the fact that just like the fossil fuel industry, you know, has tried to play down their role in climate change, and they did a pretty good job for yeah. a couple of decades. There's Now there's a little bit more attention on the animal-based foods industry, and the data are un unequivocal, but it's more recent. And so they've been doing uh, desperately trying to keep divert attention from that. There's other aspects to it, too, which, which has to do with the fact that in politics, agriculture and particularly animal agriculture has a disproportionate relative to its economic impact disproportionate political clout and so if you can keep it out of the political discussion it's much less likely to get public attention but anyway i shouldn't even be talking about this cuz i i'm not a sociologist but um <laughs> it it is a real phenomenon sure yeah i wonder too if it's to get an electric car, to move to electric car, to get solar panels, it's kind of a lot of research up front and then a decision is made and then you're living out that decision. Whereas mm -hmm. changing your eating behaviors is lifestyle modification. And if yeah, you're I think that's operating a good in the world today, yeah, I mean, it's you're still faced with the other meat products. You know, you could say I, I want to only, uh, you know, eat plant based foods, but then, you know, you go out to dinner and there's a steak and it sounds good. It's just, it's a constant decision that you have to make, wake up every day and commit to. Yeah, that's true. If it's that, of course, the whole idea of impossible foods is to make it uh, yeah. not a complicated thought process. But yeah, I think it's a good point about if you're much more deliberate about the choice you make when you buy a car, because it's a, it's a high stakes and infrequent purchase. So people actually do their homework and presumably think about all the consequences, pros and cons of the choice they're making. Yeah, when mm -hmm. you're just kind of sleepwalking through a grocery store, you know, you just defer to habit, I think, pretty much. And there's no moment of, of um, decision. So can you talk to us, for us non-scientists, exactly how plant-based meat works? Yeah, um, <laughs> that's a hard question. Um, <laughs> because, because, I mean, uh, uh, to, to talk in a meaningful way, there's yeah. a little bit of science involved, but basically what I would say is there was no plant-based meat before Impossible Foods. There were meat no. analogs, but but there, there were products there were veggie that bean, were, like bean burgers that were very different. Yes, they were they were basically yeah. <laughs> their target audience was people who were looking for an alternative. And what we set out to do from day one is we need to create products that that the most committed meat eaters will choose voluntarily because they do a better job of delivering what consumers hardcore meat eaters want from meat and and that 
meant that we had to kind of completely rethink the problem, okay? This was a, a much more challenging problem. And and the first step was we have to understand how meat from an animal works. How does it do the things that that make it so desirable to consumers? And it turned out that had never really, that kind of question had never really been seriously, believe it or not, had never been seriously asked, at least in a scientific way. And But we figured if we understand in sort of molecular terms what creates those sensory experiences that consumers value, that just based on kind of the way it works in biology, there's, you can be highly confident that you can find the right set of ingredients from the plant world to reproduce that experience. And then the other thing is, or to deliver that same experience. And then the other thing about it is that there's no reason to think that the cow is the optimal way of delivering what people want from beef. Okay. Mm. It's just the only thing we've had so far. But, mm -hmm. you know, I would say there are aspects, there are obvious aspects of, of meat from a cow that are not desired by consumers, you know, the fact that the cholesterol and yep. uh, you know, a lot of people don't like the, you know, the cartilage and the lymph nodes in their burger and stuff like that. And so, so anyway, it wasn't, it was, it was entirely plausible that we could actually do a better job in the cow and delivering deliciousness. And we've now done that for several products, which I can tell you about, where we have made products that in a blind taste test against the best-selling animal version decisively are decisively preferred by consumers on taste alone. And so, but we had to understand how it works. And the, and one of the things, there's many things we have to understand. There's texture, there's juiciness, there's, there's the visual appearance, there's, you know, how it cooks and blah, 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 blah. They're all important. Smells. Yeah. How it smells. And one of the one of the things that we discovered, and this is how I knew that no one had seriously looked at the problem, because it was, you know, not the hardest thing to discover, which is that a lot of the magic of meat, the difference if you cook if you put broccoli on the griddle, what happens? It gets it gets softer and hotter and and maybe a little caramelized, but nothing magical happens. If you could put meat on a griddle, something really magical happens, which is it completely transforms in a couple of minutes. And in the process, it just unleashes an explosion of of aroma and actually creates a whole new and much more intense flavor profile in real time. And that's and that is because there's a chemical catalyst in meat that catalyzes these chemical reactions that produce this explosion of chemistry. And that catalyst turned out to be a molecule called heme, which is an essential component of every living cell on Earth but um, super abundant in animal tissues. And it's it's the molecule that makes meat red and carries oxygen in your blood and so forth. So we discovered that, that, that the reason that meat tastes like meat and that it has this flavor and aroma profile that's unlike anything from the plant world, 95% of it is just because it has a lot of heme in it. So really what it came down to is taking a scientific approach to understanding how meat works. And then we could deliberately find sources, non-animal sources, of biomolecules that basically deliver those characteristics. And that's that's basically what it comes down to. Yeah. And how does it stack up nutritionally? You kind of mentioned a few things about the heart health impacts of red meat. Well, we have we make several products. I would say they're all lower fat, lower calorie, lower saturated fat, zero cholesterol compared to the animal version. Just to pick one, you know, the best-selling meat in the world is not beef; it's pork. Um, we really, have a, that's interesting. Oh yeah, 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 that. yeah. Chicken is a close second, and it's probably yeah. going to surpass pork. But but anyway, so we had we create a pork product. It's it's only sold on a limited basis in the U.S. It was mainly intended for Asia and Europe, where it's much more of a thing. It's a, a ground pork product. Um, it is. It has 37% lower calories than the mainstream ground pork. It has 26% lower saturated fat, has zero cholesterol, and actually has a higher protein content than pork from a pig. Same bioavailable iron, same micronutrients. And in a blind taste test in Hong Kong, where pork is a much more mainstream meat than the U.S., it was decisively preferred over pork in a blind taste test over pork wow. from a pig, okay? 
So, mm-hmm. so how does it compare nutritionally? It's a hell of a lot better. That's how it compares. Yeah. And chicken, you were just saying the best selling. It's not yet the best selling, but it'll soon be. Our nuggets, which we launched six months ago or something, I can't even keep track anymore, but not that long ago or maybe a year ago, lower calories, 60% less saturated fat, 30% less t- total fat than the best selling animal based chicken nuggets. And they're preferred three to one on taste over That's the. Great. Yeah, leading animal-based chicken nuggets. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, so there are environmental and health reasons to move to plant-based foods and deliciousness reasons. Yes, <laughs> that's the yeah. that's the thing that's counterintuitive to people. Yeah, that's why for us the critical thing is people don't think they'll that this will taste as good and it actually tastes better, but they only find that out if they try it. And yeah. and that's really the big barrier for us is because everyone's past history with plant-based products that are that that have historically been meat alternatives is that if you like meat they suck okay and mm-hmm. so people just it doesn't make sense to people that they could actually be more delicious until they try them yeah but they might have they might have been burned in the past so we got to oh, like reconvert them yeah of course and, yeah and you've said that every time you sell a product to a vegan or vegetarian it's like you know, doesn't impact your mission at all. And really your goal is to convert the meat eaters. Yeah. Yeah. Look, the 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 reason I founded the company, just to be as blunt as possible, uh, is I had zero interest in food. Okay. Um, I have zero interest in business. Okay. These are just things that, that, uh, that became important to me because of the in, in environmental cause. And, and our mission is not to be a big successful food company, that's a byproduct of our mission. Our mission is to completely eliminate the use of animals as a food technology globally, okay? And the vegetarians and vegans are not, or at least the vegans, are not doing anything to maintain that system. In other words, we have to, what we have to do is to make it a bad business to be in, you know, Mm -hmm. the animal-based food business, yeah. By taking away the customers, by delivering a product that is more delicious, that's healthier, and actually it's made a better way. Meat lovers don't love the way that their meat is made. They love meat in spite of the way it's made. They don't. It's mm. not a part of the value proposition that it's made from the corpse of an abused animal. Yeah. And and at scale, our products will be substantially less expensive because we like for beef we use 125th the land we use 1/9th the water we use less than 10% the fertilizer and agrochemicals less labor growing the plant crops because we turn them so much more efficiently into meat mm. zero labor managing the animals and our production process is much more automated so when we get to full scale it's going to be game over for that industry yeah but anyway it's all but about but now wait sorry to interrupt but now are are the prices comparable or is it slightly more now Right now, I don't know the exact ratio. By and large, our products are more expensive to consumers than the products they replace. But um, as I said, that's not because of the the fundamentals of the products. It's because we're a small company. We're building our business from scratch, okay? Uh, It hasn't been built over a thousand years. And the infrastructure, you know, we have to create the infrastructure. And... We don't have the economies of scale. Okay, we're just we're just in the process of scaling. But like I say, at at scale, it's it's no contest. Right now, I'd yeah. say that they're probably about fifty percent more expensive on average. But it really depends. I think. I mean, organic meats are far more expensive than. Oh well, that's the, a good yeah. point. Yeah. So I'm talking about compared to the commodity uh, products. Yes, our products are are our beef product is, I would say, yeah, substantially less expensive than, yeah. you know, your high-end, grass-fed, organic type of stuff, and healthier and better for the environment. Organic yeah. grass-fed does not mean it's good for the environment. In fact, mm. quite the opposite. It's the horrible economic impact of beef in particular is because it's so land-intensive. The Well, the beef industry alone occupies about a third of the continental U.S., okay? It's the the animal ag industry overall occupies 45% of the land free sur- of the ice free surface of land surface of earth okay and and that's because primarily because of the the um, amount of grazing land it takes to support 
the you know 1.7 billion cows on earth that incidentally outweigh every remaining wild mammal bird reptile or amphibian left on earth by a factor of 10 okay the mm. cows outweigh all the kind wow. of what all the wild vertebrates left on land by more than a factor of 10 and so it's it's it has nothing to do with grass fed that's that's just a mm. uh that's just propaganda from the from the beef industry Producing a pound of an impossible burger uses one twenty fifth the land area, four percent less than four percent the land area that's required to produce the same thing from a cow, and that's probably the single most important environmental metric because it's the huge land footprint of animal agriculture that's the primary reason why eliminating it will allow us to put the brakes on climate change because Freeing that land area, the global land area that's used for animal agriculture, and allowing it to recover its original sort of forests and grasslands and stuff like that, would pull out of the atmosphere the equivalent of 22 years worth of this year's fossil fuel emissions, okay? It would basically negate 22 years, the next 22 years of fossil fuel emissions, just by freeing up that land and allowing it to recover. And more importantly... That's the only way we're going to stop and reverse the complete collapse of wildlife populations and biodiversity globally, which is probably a bigger threat to humans than than climate change, although climate change is a catastrophic threat. So 125th the land. Remember that number. That's probably the most important. Wow. But our actual, the greenhouse gas emissions, the direct greenhouse gas emissions from our production process are about, about 88% less than the um, greenhouse gas emissions from producing it using a cow. So um, we use about one-ninth the water, okay, so 89% less. The, our production process, because of the crops that we get our ingredients from and so forth, compared to the crops that are grown to feed cows, less than a twelfth the fertilizer and less than a twelfth the agrochemicals that go into producing a pound of beef from a cow. So those are all, I think, meaningful metrics with respect to environmental impact. We'll be right back after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. Accessibility seems really important to you and the brand. You know, you guys appeal to a lot of consumers from those who are eating at Burger King and Carl's Jr. to I've seen Impossible listed on the menus at really high-end sit-down restaurants. And I, I mm -hmm. can't think of a lot of brands. In fact, I don't know if I can think of any brand that has managed to capture such a wide audience of customers. How did you guys go? Was this on purpose or is this just like you got lucky and the brand appeals to everyone? Well, it's it's. I don't think we got lucky, but it, it, but it's it's partly that it appeals to everyone. But think of it: the, the the on purpose part of it was when we are launching at a small scale. The thing that is valuable about sales of the product is the awareness and marketing impact. And we happen to have products that are just awesome that chefs love. Okay, that it like chefs go mm. nuts when they when they try our products because they just so blow through their expectations. And uh, that made it possible for us to launch with some of the best known chefs in the world when literally when we were still producing out of effectively like a garage. And that's what we needed because we needed 
those sales, what we needed was to send the message to consumers that this is not like anything plant-based you've ever encountered or imagined before. This is a product that is meat that the hardest mm. core meat chefs in the world will put on their menu and not only put it on their menu, but put it on on their menu as meat. So that's why those, and it continues to be when we launch in a new market, that's kind of our, one of our go-to things is launch with the highest reputation chefs. And, it's, and we're not bribing them. And, you know, it's because they get excited about this. They want to bring this to consumers. And the thing about, Another thing about those restaurants is that their menus are highly curated. So if you just mm-hmm. launch your product in, I mean, to some degree, it's true of, of of the fast food restaurants, but there it's also more of like just this uh, crazy jumble of options. But on a highly curated menu, if, if your product is there, people will notice it. And it's mm-hmm. been endorsed in an in a, a extremely meaningful way by a chef whose livelihood and reputation depends on the choices they make to put on their menu. So that's a super valuable endorsement. But the thing about our product that's not so unprecedented is actually there are a lot of basic foods that the high-end chefs and the fast food chefs basically buy the same raw material. And that's true for you know a lot of um, Let's just say ground beef. Like, there's not really much that you could detect, frankly, that's fundamentally better about the ground beef from a cow that's served in a Michelin star restaurant and what's served in, you know, a, a fast food restaurant. Really, it's, it's. In fact, it, we've done just in our experiments and so forth. We've, we've compared like supermarket ground beef to Wagyu ground beef with just blind taste tests among consumers. Generally, the supermarket ground beef is significantly preferred. It's also significantly preferred over grass-fed organic, to be honest, in applying taste tests. So our products, they're intended to be widely applicable across the gamut of applications that you use right now ground cow for, okay? I think that's, that's the point. It's not a highly special, it's not like spicy Doritos or something like that. A highly specialized product. It's more like the cornmeal that goes into making those and goes into making the highest end tortillas. So we all face naysayers, and I'm sure you have as well. I'm curious about what's been kind of the biggest roadblock, what group has been um, the most challenging for your work? Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, is it the meat it's, industry, it's perhaps? Enough. Like, well, have they, this, yeah, the, the, the lobbying? Agriculture, yeah, lobbies. certainly the slaughter industry. Here's here's the thing: this, mm. the slaughter industry, the slaughter cartel, um, oh. doesn't like us, and mm-hmm. um, they are constantly publishing and propagating disinformation. It's pretty mm. much, in fact, they use the same group, the same notorious group that was the go-to group for the tobacco industry, for yeah. the for the big oil industry, mm-hmm. propagandizing against climate change and and stuff like that, to produce propaganda against us. It's total disinformation. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many people pay attention to it, but they've certainly been putting a ton of energy into it. And interesting Mm -hmm. anecdote is that before we even had any products on, we were practically still in stealth. We had been sort of outed by the Wall Street Journal as like this company exists, but we didn't have any products on the market. The meat lobby had engaged lobbyists and I and someone showed me the email they got from the people who were trying to hire him, saying that we want to take down this silly company called Impossible Foods. And what was the phrase? It was sort of like cost is no object. Okay. Mm. In other words, they were seriously willing to try to snuff us before we even got on the market. They were threatened. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But so in the car industry, right, like the big car companies, they invested in electric and the future of their industry. But it doesn't seem like kind of the incumbents within the meat industry are doing any sort of innovation to meet consumer demand. They're just fighting it. Is that what you're seeing? Well, the the mainstream, yes, the mainstream food industry just in general, and frankly, the agriculture industry is 
the about the least innovative entity on earth, okay? Like the innovation of the year in the food industry is like a new flavor of Fruit Loops. They don't do any fundamental innovation. They don't understand fundamental innovation. They they think of this is we just do what we do. This is pretty much the entirety of food and we'll tweak it on the margins, okay? They also have this notion that, frankly, is shared by a lot of the public, that this agricultural system, overwhelmingly the, the major driver of a catastrophic collapse of global biodiversity that has reduced the pop, wild animal population on Earth by almost 70%. There's less than a third as many wild mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians, and fish on Earth as there were 50 years ago, okay? Almost entirely due to this industry. They think, though, that this industry is just like part of Earth. It's a hardware part of Earth. You can't, mm. you know, Earth, the planet cannot exist without using 45% of the land area for um, animal agriculture. So they have this very kind of locked-in worldview. Yeah, so they, they don't think that yeah. why bother innovating when basically we've already, you know, we've already got what we need. Yeah. Anyway, it doesn't matter, you know, and, and they're no good at it anyway. So, so. You know, there some of the big meat companies came out with plant-based products. I actually seriously believe that they deliberately made the same old crappy, completely unmeat-like plant-based meats just to reinforce the idea among consumers that, like, see, this stuff isn't any good. Uh, interesting, yeah. <laughs> to give the whole, yeah, the whole movement a bad name. Yeah, I'm not sure who, who you know, the, the, I guess the other thing is just public indifference and you know, lack of awareness about the main thing that's driving us at Impossible Foods is that really we're st staring down the barrel of a catastrophe that mm. is that we can completely avoid by phasing out animal agriculture. Yeah. And for biodiversity, not only avoid, but reverse it. Okay. Yeah. But that doesn't benefit us at all because no one knows and no one seems to be that interested in knowing about it, but it's going to, it's going to, when it bites them in the butt, then maybe they'll wish they had. Yeah. And are they, you know, how you know how like champagne, you have to like, you can't be champagne because only if it's from like that region of France. Mm -hmm. um, have they tried to get you guys to remove the label oh, for of sure. calling it beef? And what what's happened there? Yeah, there's been a lot of, I think, uh, lobbying at the uh, state level and even at the federal level to to impose restrictions on the use of of any sort of dis words or descriptors that that are associated with uh, animal products, I would say in general they haven't gotten a whole lot of traction. And mm -hmm. interestingly, some of our allies in fighting against those things are these like extreme sort of right wing libertarian groups that don't like government interfering with mm. commerce or. Yeah. Sure. Anything like that. Free market. So we have interesting yeah. allies there, but basically they haven't gotten a hu huge amount of traction. Recently okay. in Europe, there are some in the EU, there's some legislation going on that has a chance of succeeding that will put some restrictions on that. But yeah. that's that's a concern, but I feel like it's not a huge concern. I mean, if, if we had to call our product Schmeet, we could do it. <laughs> and if consumers knew that it was delicious and better than the animal product sure. and healthier and stuff like that, Get you creative know, with the packaging. Yeah, it's 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 yeah, it's not a horrible threat. So you mentioned earlier that you have this self-assigned mission of ending animal agriculture by I think you said 2035. Do you think we'll get there? Has your optimism on this improved or decreased since starting the company? Oh, I tell you it's actually somewhat improved because the okay. thing is that at the start we didn't we I, I believe this was doable. Okay. First of all, the critical thing is, okay. Figuring out the technical means and supply chain and ingredients and all this sort of stuff to be able to make products that in the ways that American consumers outperform the animal mm -hmm. products, okay? And we hadn't done that when I founded the company. I thought it was doable, but frankly, you can't be sure. And I didn't know mm -hmm. how hard it was going to be. Well, we have now launched several products, probably at least a half dozen products that in blind taste tests are preferred on taste alone over the animal products, and they're healthier, and at scale, they'll be much cheaper. So mm -hmm. we've sort of, I would say, got a very compelling proof of concept that from a technology standpoint, not only is it doable, but we've done it. And um, there's obviously still a lot of work to be done to make the products 
even better and cheaper and healthier and to expand the range of products. We're working on, obviously, some very different products from the ones we already have on the market and so forth. So there's still work to be done. But I would say the absolutely decisive critical step is, can you figure out how to do it? And can you create a scalable, economic, economically scalable technology platform and supply chain to do it? And basically, at this point, I think the answer is yes. And, and it's, only going to get, it's only going to get better because unlike the, the cow's not getting any better at making beef. And we, we get better literally every day at make, mm, making it. Yeah. So, so that gives me optimism. Yeah. On the business side, we've only sold our product. We launched our first factory um, five years ago. So before five years ago, we didn't even have a, a factory. Yeah. Um, you had manufacturing we, partners. Before no, we didn't. Yeah. No, literally, we we five and a half years ago we didn't have a customer. Five years ago, we oh had my gosh, you guys are that handful. new. For some reason, it feels like you've been around for a lot longer. Yeah, we well, like so to much pretend, has happened, and <laughs> we like to pretend we are. But and yeah. and then we we only launched in retail less than That's three great. years ago. Okay, That's so, so cool. from a business standpoint, we're still figuring it out. Okay, we've mm. done no significant national marketing. Where the business team is sort of learning the ropes about how to sell in, you know, in retail and and yeah. food service channels and so forth, the national awareness of our, what I would call informed awareness of our brand is about five percent. Okay, like in the U.S., hey, all my friends know about Impossible Foods. If I lived in this little bubble, I think God were famous. But but only about five percent of the U.S. population has a clue that there's such a company as impossible and that it's any different from Morningstar. So from a business standpoint, we're at a very early stage. But I would say the most important progress right. is just going like gangbusters. Mm-hmm. The number of cows that we saved from slaughter last year mm. was over 100,000. Okay. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And based on the average land footprint of a pound of ground beef. It's sort of land area times years, but we freed up a land area of more than 500 square miles that could be restored to healthy ecosystems and capture carbon by reforestation and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, so I'd say in, 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 in meaningful ways, we're having an impact but what's always on my mind is not where we were last year or where we are this year, but it's where we're going to be in five years and 10 years and 15 years that matters. Which is where, yeah. Which is Which completely is replacing the, the, the industry yeah. by, yeah. first of all, the first order of business is we have to be able to make products that outperform as judged by consumers, the animal products in all the ways that matter to consumers. Once we've done that, then it's just a matter of, you know, scaling the business and raising awareness and so forth. Yeah. We have another project that we're working on, which is sort of the the follow-on to that, which is how do we restore the land that we've mm-hmm. made um, you've, yeah. unnecessary for, for animal agriculture? That's also a very interesting um, problem yeah. and a, uh, yeah. a project. And it's non-trivial to figure out what's what's the best, fastest way to to reboot a healthy ecosystem. So I I have an idea for your marketing team. I can see like, it's very cheesy, but I can see uh, something like the way Chick-fil-A has those cows holding the signs that say eat more chicken. I don't Mm -hmm. know if you've seen this. Oh yeah, yeah, (laughs) I've seen them. Having these animals holding up signs just saying, eat more plant-based foods, eat impossible foods. I don't think it would be too hard to recruit some (laughs) some, uh, abused farm animals to sign up for that task. yeah. Awesome. Well, Patrick, thank you for everything that you're doing with Impossible. It's really fun to learn more about the journey. Um, We're going to definitely all keep an eye on what's next for you. And we really appreciate your time today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Heart of Healthcare. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. The Heart of Healthcare is a product of Offscript Health. We are a healthcare engagement company built for patients and caregivers by patients and caregivers. Our executive producers are Matthew Zachary and Andrew McDowell. Our senior producer is Brianna Seely. Our intern is Antonella Sterniolo. 
Our host is Hallie Tecco. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Brianna Seeley. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscriptnot.com. That's media at offscript.com. For more information, visit offscript.com.